Today we gather on the second Sunday of Advent. We're going to look at how stories weave together. We're going to end our sermon here. Uh, this picture's taken uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. This is the, if you've ever been down to the Fort Worth, uh, Texas stockyards, this is where the, the rodeo arena is. It's where you buy tickets. We're going to end our sermon there today, but we're going to weave in some stories of... Um, the birthing room of my first son. We're going to talk about Bethlehem. We're going to talk about you. Um, this is kind of how Scripture and Advent works. It's the weaving of stories together to make a coherent message. That is what God is about. And that's what we're about, North Point, in this season of Advent, a season that means um, waiting for the, the arrival or, or the coming of, of Christ again in our lives. Um, we're in a sermon series called The People We Meet on the Road to Bethlehem, on the way to Bethlehem. This is the place, these are the people that God wants to introduce us to. So there's um, an assumption I guess I'm making that I want to let you know about. Um, the assumption is this, that God is sovereign and God could have chosen whomever God wanted to choose to carry out God's plans. Okay, if we can all agree on that, that, that God's not limited by, by us or who we want God to pick or choose and the kind of people we want God to pick and choose to carry out his plans, God can do whatever God wants to, right? And if that is true, that means that we should pay particular attention to the people that he chose to give his most beloved gift to, his only begotten son, and to carry out this divine mission he didn't just haphazardly pick these people that the gospel writers are trying to introduce us to. They were each chosen with a purpose. And you and I might be wise of us to notice why were they, and ask the question, why, did they, why were these people chosen? What qualities did they have? Because you and I could be fostering those same qualities for when God calls on us to be used for his kingdom purposes. So, last Sunday, we began on the, the road to Bethlehem. We, we 
started to look at who did Luke introduce us to first. He, he doesn't start with Mary or Joseph. He starts with a priest by the name of Zechariah. He's the father of John the Baptist. You'll remember just a quick um, you know, rehash of who Zechariah was. Luke, Luke introduces him to us first and says that he and his wife Elizabeth, who we're going to talk about today, that they were both righteous in the sight of God and followed all the commandments. So this couple, right, has devoted their life to God. Um, Elizabeth herself comes from a very priestly background and heritage. She has status. And yet, it, you'll remember in, in chapter 1, verse 7 of Luke, it said, yet. And yet, they were without children. And that in the ancient world was a problem. Now, in, the, in our world today, we, we don't necessarily equiv- uh, make those equivalent, right? That you're blessed by God if you have children. If you don't have children, you're not blessed by God. But in the ancient world, we just have to not judge that. We just ha- need to know that Elizabeth herself names this as being a disgrace. And, she's <laughs> and then you got to love Zechariah. He probably got in trouble with Elizabeth much later in the kingdom of heaven because he adds one other little caveat to the story. He says, um, um, my, my wife is without children and she's getting well along in her years. <laughs> I don't, very bad. Not a good idea to do. It's holy scripture. She's out of childbearing years, in other words. Now, we, of course, don't know why Elizabeth is, is, is barren. She's become pregnant and had miscarriages. We, we don't know, but we just know her pain. Which makes it no surprise that when she gets pregnant, we read last week, when she does get pregnant, after the angel visits Zechariah, and remember he's muted because he does not believe the plan, so the angel says, until these things come to happen, which they will, you will not be able to speak, Zechariah. And then he, and then Elizabeth does become pregnant, and she goes into seclusion for five months. That's no surprise, right? Because she wants to protect this gift of a child. So she hides away for five months. And this is where the interweaving begins. Luke loves to interweave a story. And so now he's going to introduce a different character, a young woman named Mary. Now, we'll look at Mary in a couple weeks. She's a very important figure, obviously. But um, I I just want to mention her today because she gets introduced to us through another angelic visit. And I just want to quickly note, there's a portion of this visit that I just want to give you a preview of. We'll talk about it in a few weeks, but I want to just mention it today because Elizabeth's name comes up. The angel is visiting with Mary. Mary says, how can this be? (laughs) So let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 34 through 37. And and, uh, Mary says, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now, that's really interesting because, you know, it kind of sounds like what Zechariah said, but she doesn't get muted. Um, How can this be, since I am but a virgin, the angel said to her? The Holy Spirit, Mary, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Okay, Now, Elizabeth comes up. This is verse 36. This is really important. Verse 36 says, And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. It's, it's in those very um, next words in, in Scripture. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just put up the ma- uh, main slide right now. But, um, you know, this is when then Mary says, let it be to me as you have spoken. Now, I wanted to note that because I, I, did you notice something? We often think of Mary as being this, um, this really faithful and stoic figure. And, and she is faithful and she is stoic. But, but right when that, those passages, those words we just read, she's worried. She's concerned, right? And look at, we learned two things from that little episode. Number one, we learned something really interesting, that Mary and Elizabeth, they're related. 
It's a very general word that's used in Greek there for relative, so we're not sure what that, that relation might be. But somehow, Mary and Elizabeth know of one another, and they are somehow related. And number two, we discover something, that Elizabeth and her pregnancy gives hope to Mary. Did you catch that? See, she goes from, Mary goes from how can this be and probably feeling overwhelmed as a young teenager, unmarried, vulnerable, right? And all of a sudden, she's, she's hearing this from God. She's, how can this be? And then she hears about Elizabeth. And suddenly she moves. She shifts to say, let it be to me as you have spoken. See, right away, that tells us something important about who Elizabeth is. Elizabeth is what I call a hope giver. She, she even just, this, this pregnancy gives, gives hope. And this leads to one of the most beautiful encounters from, from two women in, in the entire scripture. Two women that God called to carry out his plan. And, and they have this beautiful encounter. It comes to us, again, woven into the story in Luke chapter 1, verse 39. So right after Mary said, right after the words we just read, and then Mary says, let it be to me as you have, as you have spoken. Look at Mary. She's so in a hurry to go see Elizabeth. Let, let's pick it up at Luke chapter 1, verse 39, if you want to follow along. And the words will be on the screen. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. That would be John the Baptist. Leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed in a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Friends, this is God's word given to us today. And we say together, thanks be to God. So um, during Thanksgiving dinner last week, I went over to Spokane, was with my family. I have two sisters. And somehow uh, birth stories came up. My sister started telling just some kind of funny family and nostalgic stories of when they gave birth to their kids. And, and, and so we just started talking about this. Um, for those of you who've experienced childbirth, you quickly realize that men and women have a far different perspective on, <laughs> on childbirth, right? Um, and let's, guys, let's really be honest here. Women are the major actors. They are what matter in this moment. Men are at least, I mean, it used to be, remember the days when, um, well, I don't remember the days, but, you know, my dad, my grandpa, grandpa, they weren't even allowed in the delivery room, just kept in the waiting room, so they're not even involved. Um, and that's moved to now we can be sometimes spectators. Um, hopefully, at best, we're, we as men, as, as husbands, are loving encouragers, but still we're onlookers. And that, that um, sometimes leads to some humorous stories. I um, then remembered the birth of our very first son, Barbara and I, and I did run this story by her, by the way, just if you're all wondering. We had gone to Lamaz class, and I don't know if any of you remember the Lamaz, you know, it was a, a way of, um, uh, uh, as a couple, you, you know, I was the Lamaz coach, I was taught to coach, and I was taught to count to 10, is what it is, and be very calm and breathe. Breathe and count. That's the coach's job. So I had my orders as the breathing coach, and during one point in, in the delivery, it was a long delivery for our first son. Um, by the way, after witnessing birth for the very first time as a dad, I began sending my mom flowers on my birthday. 
that's how impressive this is when you're actually there in the room. And I was um, coaching Barb, and it was a long delay, and something was going wrong in the room, but we were, we'd already started counting to 10, and I'm like, one, two, and then we're, we're getting going, we're, and, and, but something was going wrong in the room, and I could, Barb couldn't see it. Um, she was focused on me and the numbers we were counting, but the nurses and the doctors there, they were frantic. They were looking at some numbers on the screen up above Barbara, so I'm a little distracted, and um, I went like this. I said, okay, uh, five, six, seven, nine, <laughs> And I thought I just missed an eight. It really wasn't that big a deal to me. Barb clenched my arm and almost broke skin and blood, I will tell you. (laughs) And I'll never forget this. She looked at me with a look I've never seen on her face again or, or since or yet. And she said, you missed eight. Don't miss eight. (laughs) It was that important. And she was the major actor. Let's admit it. What I love about this encounter between Mary and Elizabeth, a very young mother and a very aged mother, two underdogs, by the way, right? Did you notice that? That goes with our first sermon. God loves to pick the underdogs, the people we don't expect, the people we've written off. In this encounter between Mary and Elizabeth, these two chosen women to bring about God's plan of love and salvation, um, Elizabeth gets to be this hope giver. She's the one who brings hope to Mary. She's the one who remembers the eight. (laughs) Not only is Elizabeth the turning point for Mary during the angelic visit, imagine this. Imagine this moment. For young Mary, we don't know where Mary is in her conversations with Joseph. That happens more in the gospel according to Matthew. So we're not quite sure how these, the timing all weaves together. But, but at best, think, even though Mary's had this assurance from the angel and knows the plan, um, we, we often got to remember Mary was probably quite worried at this point, Right? She, she's not quite sure what the rest of the plan is. Have you ever gone to the doctor and um, you walk out and you're like, oh, I should have asked this, this, and this. And so a lot of times we walk in now and we have a list of questions for the doctor, right? I, 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 I picture Mary a lot like that. Um, you know, she gets the big picture from the angel, but she must have walked away from that visit and said, I wish I would have asked a few other questions about this. How is this going to work? How did the conversation go between Mary and Joseph? Let's be honest. When Mary walks in the door, one of the reasons I think she went with haste is because she's, she's feeling overwhelmed. She's feeling anxious. She's maybe frightened. She's had some sleepless nights. And I want you to take yourself to a place in your life, a time in your life, when you've been in that place, when you've had the fright and the fear of the unknown. I mean, honestly, when you look at the angel encounter, it's not enough. Mary has a lot of worries and anxiety, and that's why Elizabeth's words to her, man, they are hope-giving words to this mother, this mother six months into her pregnancy and secluded, and she had worries of her own. And, but Elizabeth, I love this, where the baby leaps in her womb, and Elizabeth exclaims in a loud voice, Mary, I know you're worried, but blessed are you. Blessed are you, and blessed is the child that you will bear. Those words were gold, gold to that young mom. They were hope-giving words, I call them. They meant so much to Mary, that, and we know this. Do you know why we know it? Because Mary, the very next things, thing that she says is magnificent, literally, It's called the Magnificat. The very next words of Mary are, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. So from now on, all generations will call me blessed. That's Mary. Right after she has this encounter with Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth is a hope giver again. So what saddens me most as kind of North American um, churchgoers and Christians is, is what saddens me most is we usually start the Christmas story at Luke chapter 2. We want the big guns. We want Mary and Joseph, right? We, we love the words from um, Charles Schultz, uh, Charlie Brown episode. In those days, Caesar Augustus, Augustus issued a decree, right? That's Luke chapter 2. And we miss, we go right to the story of, of Jesus, but we miss what Luke wants us to get from the story, which is that when God's at work, many times we don't know what God's up to, and sometimes it feels overwhelming, and we need hope givers to come into our life and speak hope to us. We miss that if we start with Luke, Luke chapter 2. I, don't want, I want to encourage you to go back and read Luke 1 again, how the stories weave and how hope is given. I have a question for you today and a homework assignment. Who's been your Elizabeth in your life? Who has been your Elizabeth? When you in your life, when you think back over your many years, when you were at a time when you were anxious and facing an un un unknown, and maybe that's you right now in your life, who was your hope giver? When you look back on that time in your life when you were anxious or fearful or downright scared or saying, how can this be? I don't understand God. It makes no sense. Was there a person that you went to in haste to be a hope giver? That's your Elizabeth. And would you do a favor for me this week? Would you, if that person is still alive, by the way, if they have passed away, would you just journal and write a note to them and and <laughs> write a note as if they're still alive and just give that note to God and just say, thank you. And if they are still alive, if your hope giver who you, you just named in your mind is still alive, would you write a note to them this week and say, my pastor is preaching a series of sermons on, uh, on the people we meet on the road to Bethlehem. He told us about this woman named Elizabeth. She was a hope giver, and I want to tell you, you are my hope giver, and thank you. Do you know those notes mean so much when we send them? I have another assignment for you, and it goes like this. It, it goes back to that rodeo picture. Let's go ahead and put that rodeo picture back up in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, we went down to Fort Worth to um, watch a football game, TCU versus Baylor, and um, one night we went to the Fort Worth Stockyards. Anyone ever been to the Fort Worth Stockyards before? One, okay, a couple of you have been down there, and you might know it's kind of a cool place. Uh, they still do cattle drives down Main Street, I think twice a day, um, and sell cattle on the site there, the stockyards. It's also a, a tourist trap a little bit. Um, but every Friday and Saturday night, we were there on a Friday night, and we were just walking around, and we discovered there was a live rodeo that happens every Friday and Saturday night. So here's the deal. This is the ticket booth, and we walked right up there, and we walked uh, to the part there on the, the right, okay? So to the three colonnades on the right-hand side is where we, we walked up to to buy our tickets, and my son went up, and he was buying the tickets for us, and I was kind of standing back. And then I noticed on the left, in that left portico, the far left, these two um, cowgirls came up. They were probably in their late teens, early 20s, and they walked up to a window, but they didn't walk away with tickets. They walked away with numbers that they pinned on. And, and I, I watched them walking away, and I, I said, oh, that's... See, on the right side, these three porticos, that, that's where you go to buy a ticket to watch. That's the window you go if you're a contestant. And then I started watching, and sure enough, bull riders with their big old shoes coming up, they're going in there. And I thought, oh, man, this is going to be a great picture. I'm going to go up to the contestant window and just lean over like I'm signing up and, and then send a text out that says, you know, Dad's riding the bull at 7.30 tonight by accident. And, and then I thought, you know, no, I can't do that because that's too big an insult to the people who are actually going to that window and are actually riding that bull at that time. And I had this thought. I had this thought as I stood in the windows and, and watched this scene. I had this thought about what does this speak about Advent? And I thought to myself, you know, a lot of times... 
we in our faith journeys, we just think it's all about going into the stands and watching. Now, notice both, both the contestants and the, the audience, we both gave money. <laughs> but what we got back as the audience was some tickets to go sit in stands and watch his entertainment. What we discover in Luke chapter 1 is that God sometimes says, I'm pushing you to the far left contestant window. You're going in the rodeo. Now imagine, you pay your money and you get a ticket, you, you get a little thing out, and you put it on yourself, and you, notice you walk away with a far different attitude, don't you? You walk away thinking, I'm in the rodeo. This is real now. And friends, what I'm here to tell you today, Luke chapter 1 is trying to tell you something. You're in the rodeo. <laughs> in this Advent season, you're in. And it's time for you to think through, if I'm called to be an Elizabeth-like hope giver, who am I going to go give hope to this week? Is there someone in your life right now, someone in our community right now, who needs hope? Can I tell you the, the bad and the good news? Studies show that emergency rooms fill up from Thanksgiving to Christmas, till the end of the year, actually, through the new year, like at no other times. In my former church in Colorado, emergency rooms were filling up with people filled with anxiety issues from Thanksgiving to the start of the new year. The good news that I have for you and the bad news at the same time is there are so many people in the world right now who need hope, and this season in particular. So guess what? You're in the left-hand portico, and God's calling on you to be an Elizabeth, a hope giver to someone this week. So as you journey to Bethlehem, may you go with two blessed women and the hope that they give us. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for how you work, how you carry out your mysterious plans, how you put people in our life and weave stories together. And we especially thank you today for this woman named Elizabeth, who we learn was a hope giver. We thank you for the hope givers in our life, and I pray that each person here has a person or two come to mind that they'll contact this week. May that be a meaningful, meaningful conversation encounter, even if they're in your kingdom. And then, Lord, I ask one other prayer. Would you be with each of us here today, and by that same Holy Spirit that filled Elizabeth's womb and caused John to jump, would you fill, Holy Spirit, us with a person that leaps to our mind, that needs us to be a hope giver right now? Bring them into our path so that we may do the work you call us to do in the Advent season on the, on the road and on the way to Bethlehem. Lord, thank you for the hope you give all of us in Jesus' name.